Prepare for a rude awakening. He was searching for the Ark of the Covenant, but he couldn't find it. What did he find? It says the shovels, the snuffers, the spoons, the firepans, the bowls, all the vessels of brass the Chaldeans took away. And the two pillars Solomon made for the house of the Lord, the height of 18 cubits, the brass capital on top of it, the height of the brass capital was three cubits. Wait, I thought that capital sitting on top of that pillar 31 feet high was five cubits. What happened to 41.25 inches of solid brass weighing several tons sitting on top of a 31 foot column? When he got into the temple, all that was there was brass. Where was the table of showbread? Where was the golden lampstand? Where was the golden altar of incense? And where was the golden Ark of the Covenant? It wasn't there. Everything that was taken into Babylon was carefully detailed. And even Belshazzar was having a party and drinking out of the vessels of the temple, wasn't he? But yet, 70 years later, when they came back, everything was brought back. Not one thing was left in Babylon, but what never went and what never came back? The Ark of the Covenant. How did the rest of this brass, though? What happened to 41.25 inches of brass? Watch what happens. You're watching this pillar and this capital as it now sinks into this hollow column. It travels 41.25 inches and it is operating a lever system underneath the temple to hide the Ark of the Covenant. It starts out five cubits, it ends up three cubits to when Nebuchadnezzar goes in, it ends up three cubits. Watch how this operates. This is the temple, this is what it looks like from the bird's eye view. This is what it looks like from the side. You have on your far right, you have the column and you have the capital. The capital is the force that, uh, that is applied to the end of the lever. But this is a reverse lever system. Usually we use a lever to help us to lift something very heavy on, on one end and we put a fulcrum very near that heavy object and a long lever. Then we move the end of that long lever a great distance to lift a very heavy object just a short distance. This is a reverse lever system in which we have an extremely heavy weight, an incredible force on one end that's only going to move two cubits, 41.25 inches. But we can measure exactly how far it is from the middle of the pillar to the middle of the stone and know that with a 68 cubit beam and by using a fulcrum at 3.14, the distance of the length of the beam, that we can then raise an elevator on the other end over eight feet in height and get the full raising of the elevator so that the Ark of the Covenant and the taller menorah can fit in place. We see the keystones that are in the holy place are actually lock stones in which it would take four priests to go in and simultaneously stand on those four lock stones unlocking the elevator system. Now if we didn't have a damper in it, the weight of the capitals coming down would immediately launch the entire elevator right out the roof of the Holy of Holies, which would be very anticlimactic in the middle of this siege of Nebuchadnezzar. So that was already thought through, and so a damper system in front of the elevator then will then leak out sand at a rate that will allow the piston to go up, and as the piston goes up, the entire elevator room can now be raised into place. Now it says in 2 Maccabees chapter 2, verses 2 and following, that Jeremiah and several of the faithful priests being warned of the Lord in a vision. Now, why I'm quoting Maccabees is Maccabees doesn't pretend to be Scripture, even though it was in the original 1611 King James Version of the Bible, but it was removed many years later. 
It doesn't pretend to be scripture, but it is quoting from an earlier scroll uh, in the handwriting of Baruch, the scribe of Jeremiah, which indicates that Jeremiah and the priest at the time of Nebuzaradan's siege received a vision so that they would know how to hide the Ark of the Covenant, because it had been 500 years since it had been built, and no one knew how to operate the system. And so what happened is that by revelation they went up and then at the bases of these columns they with sledges would beat the bases in allowing the sand to escape and the full weight of the capitals come down on the lever ends. Then they would go into the Holy of Holies and after covering the ark would stand on the four lock stones disengaging so that the entire elevator system can now begin its upward progression. From the side we see that now the weight of the capital, forcing down, the elevator unlocked, the sand of the damper causing the piston to go up, and now the elevator begins its upward motion. After the event, you can see as you continue watching the monitor that the capital is going to press down into place a stone that would be the same size as all the other stones up on the Temple Mount. So after the destruction of the temple, you could not tell that anything had transpired from the outside. Then taking the Ark of the Covenant, which represents all the articles of gold, into the elevator system, then operating a second sand trap, then would allow the sand to escape and for the entire elevator room to then seat down into the subterranean passage under the temple. Then all the lock stones would then again lock down into place. The Ark of the Covenant would be taken into the subterranean passage, and when the temple was destroyed, there would be no evidence that anything has transpired. Now, just as the Lord said he would dwell, Shekinah in thick darkness, I, Solomon, built thee a house to dwell in, an exalted residence, and a place to abide forever. The Ark of the Covenant and the other articles left the temple by Jeremiah and were hidden away in the cave. And as Jeremiah heard that one of the priests began to mark out the way to the Ark, when Jeremiah heard it, he rebuked the priest and said, The Ark must remain in this secret place until the Lord God brings it forth in the last days, and His glory will be seen above the mercy seat as it was in the days of Moses and as it was in the days of Solomon. So. In Solomon's quarries under the city wall of Jerusalem, that is where Jeremiah found the stone case that Solomon had put there 500 years before. And he took the Ark of the Covenant and hid it and put it in that stone case that Solomon had prepared for a place for the Ark to remain forever. And then on the way in, one of the priests began marking out the way and in the 1800s a French explorer found a half-carved cherub in this cave system, he chiseled it off the wall. It's sitting in the British Royal Museum to this very day. The only thing that remains of it is this steel marker down there that speaks of the guarding cherub that was chiseled off the wall. That's the last marker and how, how to find the Ark of the Covenant. Now this becomes very important because from that place where the stone is in the middle of the temple, you take a straight line right dead center through the middle of Solomon's quarries and it takes us to where the stone case was buried outside the north wall of the city of Jerusalem. First prepared by Solomon, then the ark was put in there by Jeremiah at the siege of Nebuzaradan with the Babylonian Empire. And the pillars of brass, the Chaldeans broke them the brazen sea, and carried all the brass to Babylon. And it described everything, including the capital of brass, but the capital of brass was five cubits tall. Why is it five cubits now? Because when Nebuzaradan came into the temple, the machine had been operated. All they could see when they burned the temple was the 18 cubit pillars and the three cubits of capitals on top. But when they broke them in pieces, they saw that the capitals are still five cubits tall. And they took them away into Babylon. All the secrets were there. And just as Solomon said, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it is the glory of kings and the king's kids to search them out. That's why no 33rd degree mason knows what the king's kids know at this point. Now, we take you to the days of unleavened bread, the year 4029, because it all works into the fulfillment of the spring feast of the Lord. And so now 
we are going to see, as we look at the spring fulfillment of the Feast of the Lord, we see that each one of the feasts have an initiation and they have intermediate and final fulfillments. And we look at, again, your biblical Hebrew calendar and look at the Feast of Unleavened Bread and when it transpires. On the 10th day of the month of Abib, that is when the Passover lamb is selected. That's when it was done in Egypt, and that's when it was done every year after that. And then for the next four days, the Passover lamb is inspected, and then it is killed on the 14th in the afternoon, the 14th day of Abib, or Nisan as it's called, after the Babylonian captivity. Then after it is killed, it is put in the oven before sundown, because sundown begins the high day, the high Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It is a high Sabbath. That night, in the middle of the night, we left Egypt. Seven days later, on the 21st, is when we pass through the Red Sea. And that also, according to Leviticus 23, is another high Sabbath. A high Sabbath at the beginning, a high Sabbath at the end, and there is always going to be a weekly Sabbath sometime during that week as well. The day after the weekly Sabbath will always be the feast, or excuse me, the day of the first fruits offering. Now, to look at this at the week of 4029, we then see, also, I forgot to mention this, that from the day of first fruits, you count 50 days, and that takes you to the high day of Shavuot, or Pentecost. Pentecost means 50th, the 50th day from the day of first fruits. And that is what finalizes the spring feast. Now I want to take you to Jerusalem in the year 4029. And this is the rehearsal, the mikrah, that had taken place for hundreds in, yes, over a thousand years. It is on the 10th day of the month of Abib in which the high priest would be on the Temple Mount and he would then leave the Temple Mount, and as he walked off the Temple Mount, he would leave behind him, shoulder to shoulder, priest of Israel, Kohanim, standing shoulder to shoulder with big 10 to 12 foot, foot palm fronds in their hands, and they would make a path for him all the way out the north gate of the city of Jerusalem. And so this was to facilitate when he left the city wall to go out to Bethlehem to select a Passover lamb for the high priest, that when he came back, the pathway would be there for him so he could go back up to the Temple Mount without anything interfering. And as he got out to the north gate, he would then lead several hundred priests there with the palm fronds in their hands, and then he would take his small entourage with him out to the sheepfolds of Bethlehem, where the, all the temple Passover lambs were bred, raised, and groomed, and waiting for him to make the selection of the most perfect Passover lamb that was to be representative for all of Israel, even though thousands of Passover lambs were sacrificed each year on the Temple Mount. Now, as part of this whole rehearsal, over 150,000 to 200,000 Israelites from all over the kingdom and all over the lands where they were dispersed would come up to Jerusalem and they would come up early and purify themselves. They would go up onto the Temple Mount where there were over 100 mikvah pools or baptism pools up here and they would purify themselves in preparation for the festivities because in each feast there were rehearsals that they were expecting each year that the Messiah may come this year. Maybe this is year. Maybe this is it. So they would get ready. On the way in to Jerusalem, they would cut down cedar boughs and pine boughs and also the palm fronds, which uh, after the date harvest were, were plentiful. They would bring these into the city and as they then would stay in every available apartment, extra bedrooms, the city of Jerusalem was absolutely jam-packed. 150,000 people in every nook and cranny and all along the walls in Jerusalem and all the buildings they would have the cedar boughs and the palm fronds all stacked up waiting for this day. Because on the 10th day, of the month of Abib, the high priest left the city of Jerusalem, went out and selected the lamb, and when he came back in, when he arrived at this gate, the priest at this gate, as soon as he came to the gate, would begin crying out, Hosanna in the highest! Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord! And when he did that, right then, all of the priests along this line who couldn't see the high priest began shouting out, Hosanna in the highest! And then 150,000 people rushed out of every corner of Jerusalem, grabbing their palm fronds, taking their tallits off, and going out to that passageway, crying out, Hosanna in the highest. It sounded like a hurricane in the city streets of Jerusalem. 
Cecil B. DeMille could never portray this. He could never afford the extras for it. It was bigger than anything Hollywood has ever done.